Um, this is uh, an important piece, the next two. At, two, at 1220, the NRC asked TMI, what is the temperature in the core? Um, TMI got back to them shortly thereafter, and they said, we don't know. The computer is printing question marks. And then they said, that means the computer is messed up. In fact, question marks meant that the temperature in the core was over 700 degrees. It, they didn't know how high, but it knew it was high, and it was another indication of a meltdown in progress. So um, the other piece of this is that two were not two temperature indications were not the question mark. They were 599 degrees, and they never told the NRC that hey, we got two that are still on scale reading 599. Uh, in fact, they said the computer's messed up. Well, a couple minutes before two. There was a hydrogen explosion. Now, the industry will call it a hydrogen burn, but it was a hydrogen explosion. Uh, in lay terms, there was a big change in pressure and a loud noise that shook the building. To me, that's an explosion. In industry jargon, it's a, it's a hydrogen burn, but it was an explosion. Uh, the NRC was informed two days later. Plant manager Miller was in the control room at the time, based on affidavits from four reactor operators. They all said Miller knew about it. And the control room shook. Now when your building starts shaking, I think that's about the last indication you need that you really should let the civilians know to, to head for the hills. Um, after that, um, it, was, it was unconscionable that an evacuation wasn't ordered on the first day. I would say 7.30, but even if you give them the benefit of the doubt at 2, an evacuation should have been ordered on the first day. Okay. Uh, did the containment leak? What's wrong with that picture? This is the audience participation section. See the spike? This, this is not this is not post grad engineering here. There's a spike there. This is the containment pressure. This is this recording was available to the operators in the in the control room, and a little before two o'clock there was a huge spike in pressure. Um, the peak of that, whoop, whoop, ah. oh, I'm back. Okay, I'm sorry. Hit the robot. The peak is about 28 pounds. Um, it's not clear that that really is the peak. The needle was moving so fast it might have left the page. Um, but the, the, the industry's position is that the peak um, containment pressure was designed for 40 or 50, so therefore the containment didn't leak, the peak was below it. There's a couple problems with that. Um, now what I've done on the next slide is I've cut out from 2 o'clock to about 4 o'clock, but this is the slide I'll essentially be referring to in the discussion. Well, uh, to me, what's important here is that before the spike, the containment was pressurized. It was at roughly 2, 3 pounds of pressure. That means it's containing, because the core is generating a lot of heat, and um, uh, just like in a pressure cooker, the, the pressure's above what it is outside. After the accident, the containment goes down to zero. It sits at outside after that. Now, the, the rapid drop was due to core sprays going on and um, mechanisms to drop the containment pressure quickly. And on top of that, with a hydrogen explosion, it wouldn't stay high anyway. But after about five minutes, uh, any of those pressure mitigating and energy removal systems were gone. So the accident should have, uh, if the containment really had maintained its integrity, this line should be about three, three pounds higher than where it is. Okay, the same spike, I just shortened it a little bit. So the other piece of this is that's the containment pressure for the entire containment. There's something called subcompartment pressurization. This explosion didn't occur in the whole containment, it occurred in the subcompartment. Some photographs after the fact, five or six years after the fact, showed uh, doors being blown off their hinges um, in a subcompartment. So it's very likely that a subcompartment could have exceeded 100 pounds per square inch. So what I believe happened, based on subcompartment pressure, is that a leak occurred in a portion of the containment wall and uh, perhaps not all through the containment, but a portion of that containment wall got a crack and started to leak. Um, and I base that on the 
fact, a couple things in pursuing slides, but before three pounds, after zero, never recurring. Zero is atmospheric in this system. Now, uh, during the trial, the uh, plaintiffs hired Dr. Wrightblatt <coughs> from the University of Bridgeport. Dr. Wrightblatt's a um, uh, structural engineering professor at Bridgeport, and this is what he said. A plausible release of up to 8 to 10 percent of the volatiles may have occurred due to the unavailability of the containment system at the time of the accident. So Wrightblatt concluded that about 10 percent of the radiation within the containment leaked out at the uh, as a result of that of that pressure spike. I'll get to what that means as far as total radiation in a minute. But if you don't want to believe Arnie Gunnarsson, this guy's a professor of uh, structural engineering at the University of Bridgeport. And his expert report is part of the trial transcript. Okay, to my mind that wasn't enough. So what I did was I went back into old plant data, conveniently provided by John Daniel, an industry expert against me. So this is industry data I went back through. And I found three radiation detectors that went off scale within an hour after the explosion. Now remember, most of the radiation detectors had already gone off scale. I found three that were on scale that suddenly then went off scale immediately after the explosion. And there, um, the, uh, the first one um, recorded a five-fold increase, and here's the numbers. You can trace it back. The second one recorded a tenfold increase and then went off scale. And this one I think is the most interesting. This one doubled. And it was protected by four inches of lead. Well, four inches of lead will eliminate everything except the most powerful gamma rays. And um, the, um, so in addition to a doubling of incredibly powerful gamma rays, what this also shows is there had to be low-level gammas and a lot of alphas and a lot of beta that were also released that this instrument never picked up. So for those three reasons, the shape of the curve, Dr. Wrightblatt's analysis, and this forensic evidence, I believe I can show that the containment leak. Yeah? And where were those monitors located? You'd have to go back in the transcript. But what I did is uh, two of them, say. they were very near the containment. They weren't, oh, uh, okay. yeah, I went in the mm -hmm. annular gap around the containment and in areas right next to it in the auxiliary building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, how much radiation escaped is the last question. And uh, uh, I should preface this. I, I, I don't believe that there's a UFO in Area 51. I, I believe that uh, Kennedy was shot by one guy. And I believe that two airplanes crashed into the World Trade Center and knocked it down, and there's no conspiracy on any of that. I, however, I believe that the data for, for Three Mile Island on releases is significantly larger than is reported by the federal government. Okay, this is how Dilbert would explain it. <coughs> the secret's in the spreading. We'll talk about that. Um, you have to remember that um, there is no measurement of how much radius was released. Every monitor was, was broken. It had failed high. It had burned out, like turning the camera towards the sun or something like that. Every radiation monitor in the plant had burned out on the releases. So what happens is that assumptions had to be made based on off-site exposures. And you know, for instance, uh, if I've got seven I don't smoke cigarettes, but let's say I had seven packs of cigarettes, and uh, we were in a large auditorium and not a small room, and I started to smoke, and you couldn't see me smoking, but you could smell the smoke, and you're not downward from me, you're off to the side. And I asked you at, at the end of my smoking, how many cigarettes did I smoke? Well, you could make assumptions about the concentration of smoke and back calculate how many cigarettes. And there's a lot of assumptions that have to be made. But what has happened in Three Mile Island is that a lot of assumptions were made, and all of them were non-conservative. They were all low-ball assumptions, and I'll talk about that. So the key is the assumptions. Another builder? <laughs> and we can see Dilbert's my favorite comic strip. There's no more Dilbert's. Okay. Um, John Collins was a, a guy pretty high up in the NRC structure. 
And this is what he had to say about off-site monitoring. Uh, Colin said, my problem, the concern I have about aerial monitoring is that for the first three days, we were pretty much into a very static air condition. There was very little dispersion. When you're flying your helicopter and taking your aerial measurements, you're actually reading erroneous readings. I really doubt some of the measurements that were made. You know, if you watch a helicopter do a rescue, what happens? It's taking clean air from up above and blowing it down and pushing the water out. Well, the same thing was happening with the aerial surveys around TMI. The helicopter was taking clean air and blowing it down on the radiation detectors that hung below. Uh, so uh, the, I agree with Collins that whatever came off the helicopters is erroneous. Um, second is that the wind was very light, and this is important in a river valley site, and I think uh, rolls into what Dr. Wind will show. Um, in a river valley site, in the morning, um, you get very, very static air, and the plume was meandering, but it wasn't traveling very fast, and that's a concern. Uh, more on Collins. Not only should we have good monitors, but also people who understand how to use them. That was a problem since day one. They get the data and no one sits down and evaluates the data to try to understand what it means. This is the NRC talking about the data which was recorded off-site after the accident. And the last, and what probably the most important, is they had to chase the plume in a car. Now, as I was explaining, the plume variation from the center of the plume, six degrees off. If you miss the plume by 600 feet, You'd, have, you'd be measuring 1,000 or 10,000 times less radiation than was on the center line. So when you hear about a person being exposed and you know, the, the metallic taste or there's some <coughs> air loss issues or something like that, and perhaps <coughs> the neighbor wasn't, well, the reason was that the dispersion of the plume was, was very narrow. And you could easily have a factor of 10,000, according to a Dr. Bergeiner, who's the meteorologist on the job, um, when you look just 600 feet off at a mile. It would be about 1,200 feet off at two miles. But again, the further out you go, you just have to move a couple hundred feet off the center of the plume to have a dramatic difference in the amount of radiation. Um, the NRC estimates that uh, about 10 million curies, it's on their website, 10 million curies of radiation were released. Um, a curie is 37 billion disintegrations per second. So just for the heck of it, I multiply 37 billion times 10 million, and there's an awful lot of zeros there. These are disintegrations per second. And in static air, that radiation stays behind and just keeps disintegrating at that rate every second until it can get blown out. Um, I think the NRC's estimate is wrong, and I've got a couple different ways of proving it. But it's important that we're starting at a number 10 million. We won't worry about curious disintegrations. 10 million is what the NRC said was released. This number came, was, was uh, created by an NRC manager named Lake Barrett. That's not a place, that's a person's name. Um, and it's actually a new reg 0637 appendix C, his analysis. Um, Barrett used time average plume dispersion as opposed to um, hour to hour plume dispersion. And that has a tendency of flattening the curve. So it reduces the exposure. Barrett assumed that the center of the plume hit the detector. And I've already shown that if you were off by 600 feet, you got a factor of 10,000 difference. And Barrett then averaged seven days of data or eight days or 10 days of that data and wound up with a number lower than any of the numbers in his calculation. It's kind of interesting. Um, this is from Barrett. Barrett says on the first day of the accident, 14 million curies were released. Well, the NRC's website of which he was a member, says it's 10 total. If you add up all of Barrett's numbers, he comes up with 36 million curies. So this is the NRC's estimate, but the website shows 10. Um, and on top of that, the NRC's estimate is, did I flick that just as you were taking that picture? Yeah. Oh, um, the NRC, the, the time averaging of the dispersion can cause a tenfold error. Being on the center line of the plume versus being off the plume by just a little bit can cause a thousand. I put here, in fact, some of the data says a 10,000 fold error. And averaging the data changes it by about a factor of three. The net effect is that the NRC's 10 million could be wrong a thousand fold.